Within minutes of sitting down for this interview, Madison Mayor Paul Soglin had already lived up to his reputation of being a little bit gruff. Perfect. All right, you want to pop the headphones on so you can hear yourself? No. But he did put on the headphones. And then we talked about his campaign for governor. Paul Soglin's one of 10 Democrats hoping to challenge Governor Scott Walker this fall. I'm Jesse Opoyan, the Cap Times political reporter, and this is Wedge Issues, a podcast about the 2018 elections in Wisconsin. Stay tuned for my interview with Mayor Soglin, but first, let's catch up on the news. All right, so joining me this week, we have special guest news editor at the Cap Times, Jason Joyce. Thanks, Jason, for joining me. Thank you for allowing me to parachute into wedge issues. Well, we'll see if you can hold up to Eric's place. It's a tough, it's a tough spot. Yeah, to be in. yeah. It's, I have confidence. We've good. Got a, Thank we've got you. good topics this week, too. So many good topics. Um, yes, you went to a strip club last week. My first time ever for work. For work. Yeah. Yes. Asterisk. For work. For work. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So what what do you do? How do you approach going to a strip club of all places for work and in a professional capacity that is not working at the strip club? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. We should be clear. This was for this job. Right. This work. Um, so, yes. So Stormy Daniels was in town performing at, at Silk Exotic in Middleton and... I really had no idea what to expect. Um, as we know from their advertisements, it's what f- full nude, full alcohol. That's that's what <laughs> that's they tell us. That's what they tell us. <laughs> um, so it, I guess, like it didn't. I, I just, I walked in right and just started talking to people. Um, I kind of expected people to be a little more skittish about talking to me. Um, you know, like you cover a political rally and people are usually expecting to be interviewed and they're excited and like very passionate about stuff, but. Um, I assumed maybe not so at a strip club, except it turned out that a lot of the people who were there were sort of the kind of people that you would encounter at a political rally. So yeah. they were all like really happy to talk about it. My takeaway, I mean, everyone was super nice. Like the, the dancers were nice. The owners were nice. The people who were there were nice. Stormy Daniels was nice. <laughs> it's a very yeah. nice experience. That's that's something else. <laughs> But it was a it, like people that you talk to. This was definitely like a political act for them. Yeah, I mean, some of them compared it to a political donation. So, I mean, tickets were to just to get in. It was it was fifteen dollars if you bought your ticket ahead of time. That worked its way up throughout the night to I think thirty, and you could buy all kinds of packages for tables and bottle service and all that stuff. There was merchandise sure. for sale, and every purchase that people made who were there for this particular reason, they sort of likened it to contributing to the Stormy Daniels legal fund, basically. I mean, she's suing Donald Trump, and there were, you know, men who said, you know, if she's the one who can take him down, that's great. There were women who viewed her as, like, a feminist icon almost, this, yeah. like a woman standing up to the president. So, um yeah, people saw it as sort of a patriotic activity. I, I was, <laughs> that was amazed. What they were telling themselves. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't believe your story was the only one that quoted someone saying, "I will be able to tell my children and grandchildren about this someday." Yeah, you know, I <laughs> I wasn't sure how serious I, that that was definitely something that more than one person said. I yeah. wasn't sure how serious the person I heard it from was about it. She was a little tongue in cheek. But when I asked her, I was like, do you really think you're going to be talking to your grandchildren about Stormy Daniels? And she's like, I don't know if he takes Trump down, maybe. Huh? Yeah. So, I, yeah. Consequential. Right. Interesting. Yes. So after that. After that. After uh, that, everything was boring. <laughs> <laughs> but we there in an interesting moment in again in sort of the the turmoil of Wisconsin politics took place earlier this week with the special elections, the special legislative elections, two of them. Scott Walker tried to not have these elections because uh, this is such a short timeline. Both of these seats are up again in November, so he got taken to court um, by Eric Holder's group and some plaintiffs in Wisconsin. Not the first sign of uh, outside money coming in ahead of these elections. Won't be the last. But he was ordered to do that. And this this was an assembly seat um, just north of Madison, really in the, in the Lodi area, and a state senate seat in the northeastern portion of the state, sort of Door County, stretching really all the way down into Calumet County. The, the takeaway was 
I guess a split decision, you you would call it. Um, yeah. Dems, Dem- yeah. So they, we, I guess we should say they were both held by Republicans before. Right. Right. So net net win maybe by the Democrats, but maybe the results allowed both parties to sort of bring their own narrative after the after the uh, results. Were I think announced. that's exactly what happens. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's obviously a huge win for Democrats in the first Senate district in particular. Hasn't been held by a Democrat since the 1970s. So that's that's good in terms of momentum. And, you know, this is win number three really for them this year after yeah. um, state Supreme Court race and after the 10th Senate special election. But it also allows Republicans to say, you know, maybe not so much on a blue wave. They're calling it the blue trickle. Um, the, you know, this this whole blue wave, red wall narrative, it, it really allows both sides to, to carry that. Both of these seats, we're going to see rematches in November. Yeah, that's what's really interesting. Maybe you can talk about that. Like, there, these these offices have been staffed. If you're a constituent in that district and you have a problem, you know, you need something from your state rep or your senator, you've still been able to get that, that job done. Um, Will these two people be doing any legislating between now and November? Likely not. I mean, 99.9% and the answer is no. I mean, there's there's certainly nothing scheduled between now and then. They will be presumably going to their offices, spending time staffing the Capitol. But yeah, I mean, basically this is campaign season. So everyone else who's in office is out campaigning and that's what these folks have to do. There's a there's a primary on the Republican side in that, that first Senate district. So it's not clear what's going to happen there, mm-hmm. but it, it looks like for the most part, it's going to be the same matchups that we saw basically round two um, from June to November. Interesting. And we know not too much about both of these people who won, um, we know that uh, John Plummer is a is, is a dangerous man. He owns Karate Studios That's and has right. like a seventh degree black belt, right? Yep. And Caleb Frostman can catch a mess of panfish and it will proudly display them for you, right? Yeah, he's like your stereotypical like burly northeastern Wisconsin dude, apparently. Yeah, um, yeah I mean they both they both look like just Wisconsin guys. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was, I guess, the, the winner of, of this election was the Wisconsin man. Huh. <laughs> That's good to know yeah. for all of us yeah. Wisconsin men. Wisconsin yeah. men can, can rest <laughs> easy. <laughs> I mean, do we have any indication? People are uh, are still interested in this stuff, right? We're still, we're still yeah. a very political state. We're still very divided and we're still very energized on both sides. Yeah, I think any any talk of election fatigue, we used to hear that phrase a lot after the recall and after presidential primaries. I don't think that exists this year um, yeah. on either side. Well, good. Good yeah. for those of us who are in this business. Right? <laughs> it's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, I look forward now to hearing this interview that you have with... Paul Soglin. Paul Soglin, Madison our mayor. mayor. His honor, Dumb mayor, uh, mayor for life, um, yes, iconic figure in our in our area. Yes, I can't wait. I am excited. I am a little disappointed. I did this interview before the state dem convention, where we all know he actually came in last place. He got one vote, a single vote, and we still have yet to determine whether it was him voting for himself, his campaign manager voting for him, or or somebody else, some random. Soglin. That's a mystery. If if you are the Soglin voter and you're listening to this podcast, we want to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, please definitely. call us. Call us. <laughs> Tell us what's what's up. And maybe you've changed your mind since then. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jason. Thank you so much. So after we got our headphones on, I asked Paul Soglin what he thinks when people say Democrats shouldn't run a Madison liberal for governor. The pundits who profess to make these kinds of really dumb statements contradict history and contradict the facts. I can't believe that there are so many people out there who are making those kinds of statements who don't know what they're talking about when the evidence is right in front of them. If you look at the Democrats who have won statewide, Jim Doyle, Tammy Baldwin, Russ Feingold. They're from Madison and Dane County, and they are unapologetic liberals and progressives. And we go back to what happened when I turned to Sarah Soglin and said, what do you think about my running for governor? And she said, you can run, but only if you can win. I mean, she's holding me the toughest test possible, and 
That's why we hired a very reputable pollster, Paul Maslin. Paul doesn't tell you what you want to hear. He tells you what the facts are and what you need to hear in terms of structuring a successful campaign. So we did a we did a poll, and we did the standard poll where you put the two candidates, Scott Walker and Paul Soglin, head to head, and I beat them. But that's not good enough. You have to frame the candidates the way it's going to be in November when all the negatives come out. And so we put out there what we thought were properly uh, anticipating, and we did, given what happened when I announced. Yeah. And we said four things about me. We gave them my age. We pointed out that I had led anti-war demonstrations during the Vietnam era, that, quote, I was a tax-and-spend liberal, okay. and that I gave the key to the city of Madison to Fidel Castro, which is exactly what the Walker folks hit me with in that whole week that they yep. attacked when I announced. And the numbers got better. When you raise the Castro thing, you got that segment of Scott Walker supporters raised in the Cold War, right wing, they're not going to change. That attack on me appeals to them, but that doesn't get Walker any more votes. It doesn't cost me any votes. But when you look at those who are under the age of 45, particularly under the age of 40, they at most were teenagers when the Berlin Wall came down. They're not wrapped up in an ideology based on the Cold War. They very likely had Che Guevara t-shirts when they were in high school or college. And they kind of look back and they say, oh, that's kind of (laughs) cool. I don't know if it's cool or not, but that attack doesn't work. And so when you've got these, these false prophets who say that a Dane County, Madison liberal can't win statewide, not only do they ignore history, but they ignore the facts. When you launched your campaign, you said you were going to do this supper club style. Yep. Um, what does that mean? How's it going? That's going wonderful. Um, we were up at Quince a week ago, up in Baraboo. Of course, locally here, I uh, love going to uh, Toby's. But it's, it is a great way of meeting people, not hanging out with political gurus, but meeting ordinary Wisconsinites, the people who go to work every day who are concerned about their health insurance, who are concerned about retirement, who are very concerned about whether or not their grandchildren are going to grow up in the community where they raise their kids. I was struck by a line in the Isthmus profile on your campaign that you you do you sit down and you kind of wait for people to approach you rather yeah. than going around. Um, why, why is that the, the way that you're doing this? And do people really come up and, and yes. say... Yeah, and, and, and here's, here's what it is. Okay. When, you, when you're in a private place, mm-hmm. like uh, a supper club or a diner, it's wrong to go and intrude on people's space. Uh, I, I don't want to inflict myself on anyone. But there's a lot of folks who are out in the evening who are looking for conversation. So you grew up in Chicago. Important question. Are you really a Bears fan? I am. And I just want to point out that in New York City, Mayor de Blasio is a Boston Red Sox fan. Yeah. And uh, he still managed to get elected. Okay. You don't think that's going to hold you back? No. Okay. Um, More on on that question. How did your upbringing in Chicago uh, shape where you are today? I consider myself very, very fortunate to have been brought up in the neighborhood and the community uh, where, where, where I was raised from basically the age of four until 16. It was an integrated neighborhood, not only African Americans, but we also had a significant Japanese population. And you have to remember, this is in the shadows of World War II. We had a, a classes year after year that were mixed in terms of race, in terms of income. And even one year, uh, I was the only white kid in one of my classes. And that obviously taught me a lot, taught me a lot about race, taught me a lot about class. And it also fermented my interest in social and justice issues so that by the time I was 15 and uh, the civil rights movement was active in the South, particularly uh, in terms of Woolworths, which wouldn't serve African Americans at the lunch counter, uh, we were doing sympathetic boycotts of the local Woolworths in our community. 
and that just carried on through my arrival here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. When you look back at um, you know, the, the college kid who was protesting and, and then the, the young mayor, what do you see in yourself that's the same and how have you changed by you know, years in, in public service and in the private sector? Well, the first thing I would say is that I've continued to have a belief in the goodness of people and that we can make life better every subsequent generation. I guess what's been disappointing over the years is that there are significant setbacks. These backward steps are are difficult to handle, but overall I really believe decade in, decade out, life will get better for a majority of people. So if as one goes to read up on you, there are a lot of headlines and descriptors that refer to you as curmudgeonly mm-hmm. or a grump or a grouch. Why do you think that is? Do you think you are one? I learned a lesson early on in the 70s, which is the toughest thing in life, but particularly in public life, is saying no to your friends. There are times when they're wrong. There's times when there's enough money to fund something. And so unlike a lot of elected officials, I will say no. And not only will I say no, but I'll be persistent about it and I will reinforce it. And oftentimes it's not just because of a particular incident, but it's also because of my concern of a developing pattern. So when I start saying no and I start Uh, being critical on on these issues, I I get that reputation. So looking ahead, say you're elected governor, I'm going to ask you top five or or fewer things you would (laughs) seek to undo and top five things you would seek to implement. And I know it's a long list. Well, the top one thing Mm -hmm. is putting together the complete list of all of the preemptions and all of the disastrous things that, that has been done during these Walker years. So one of the sections of that list is going to be all the preemptions in regards to taking away local communities' ability to regulate landlord-tenant law, taking away the control over the local school district by local school boards, the legislation that's been adopted that's so repressive and designed to suppress the vote, ranging from voter ID to controlling when city and county clerks can register people or take their ballots. There's just a whole list. Uh, I am confident, given the ineptness of the Walker administration, the sloppiness with which the Foxconn deal was put together, that we will have no problem finding violations of both statute and agreements. And then, as I've done in in my my position as mayor of Madison, I'm going to turn the spigot off in terms of the money. If they want to continue, we're going to renegotiate the deal. Restoration of of workers' rights, and that's another area of preemption, whether we're not just talking about the rights of unions to organize, but we're also talking about project labor agreements. Then what we're going to do is have a ceremony, and we're going to go to the DNR offices, and people in unison will have the opportunity to smile and say, climate change and global warming. Uh, We're going to reintroduce those words into the state vocabulary and get to work on on a number of issues, not just dealing with climate change, but what's one of the biggest challenges here in Wisconsin, and that is water. So I could go on, but but as, as I go over that list, it's an inventory of the deterioration of the quality of life throughout the state. And we haven't even gotten into the, the social issues, the Uh, challenges in regards to health care, the challenges in regards to dealing with people with substance abuse problems and behavioral health issues. Is there anything you think Scott Walker has done well in office? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) No one in the history of this state has done such a good job of taking public money and in a legal fashion funnel it to political supporters so they could then turn around and invest in his campaign. I care about this state deeply and these issues are going to be with me for a long time. Us talking about a five-year plan is not helping me. It may be fine for you, but it's not helping me. Now, whether they're from the community, I don't care. Whether they're from space, I don't care. As long as they can provide the best visual experience for Madison. Keep hope alive. Keep 
hope alive. These are Cap Times Talks, smart conversations about big topics in Madison. Look for Cap Times Talks on iTunes or anywhere else you find podcasts. Are you ready for the fun portion of the interview? Sure. Okay, we do a lightning round. So first thing that comes to mind, don't have to think about it too much. Politicians have to be careful. I know. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It shouldn't be too hard. Favorite Wisconsin beer? Oh, geez. Oh, probably something out of New Glarus. Okay. Now, you're not an old-fashioned fan, I read. I'm not an old-fashioned fan. I am not. Uh, When it comes to hard liquor, I like my scotch, and I like it neat. Well, I can understand that. That's respectable. (laughs) But Sarah is a great old-fashioned fan. So you've got somebody to hold you up in the the supper clubs. Yeah. Um, Best advice that your parents or, or a loved one gave to you growing up? Well, my father said to me, it's a good thing your head's attached to your neck, otherwise you'd lose it. (laughs) Um, Meaning to put things away and know where they were and be orderly. (laughs) That's helpful. Favorite concert that you've ever attended? Ooh, boy, that's a a tough one. Um, Favorite. Really, really enjoyed probably the Eagles. Mm, Good. Do you know what your first concert was? Oh, good grief. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I went to, I remember as a kid, I went to folk singers like Pete Seeger and Josh White. But in terms of rock and roll, well, I'll tell you this. There used to be a building out at the Alliant Energy Center, which was called uh, something like the Youth Building. Okay. And we'd heard that there was this new rock group coming from New York that was playing there. And the building, the room wasn't much more than just a, a box. And uh, we actually hooked up with the uh, the band and invited them back to our apartment. <laughs> this was in the fall of 1965. Okay. And that was the Loving Spoonful. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's awesome. So that was fun. That's pretty cool. Uh, tell me about the mustache. How long have you had the mustache? Why do you have the mustache? Um, Can you imagine life without it? I grew the mustache somewhere around late 67, 68. And I've always had it except for one day. One day around 1984, 85, Rachel had just been born. Um I shaved it off, simply wanting to know what it looked like. And Sarah was curious, and she'd never. yeah. And um, curiously, as I looked at myself, I looked very much like my youngest brother. (laughs) Uh, Really incredible. And then it just grew right back. (laughs) The next day. (laughs) And so here we are. Here we are. Okay. Um, Political role models. Oh, geez. Well, you know, one of the reasons I came to Wisconsin was because of the political heritage of the state. There were two politicians that I knew of, uh, for which I had tremendous respect. One, obviously, was Bob LaFollette, but the one who was in office at the time and really was a model, a role model, was was Gaylord Nelson. Gaylord Nelson, and then over the years, I was to meet our congressman, Bob Kastenmeyer, and actually I admired him long before I met him because I wrote papers about him for my political science classes in the 64, 65 period. So I would say those two Wisconsin politicians uh, during my lifetime, Kasten Meyer and Gaylord Nelson, would be the role models. Do you have any pets? Yes. What kind of pets do you have? Um, we Up until recently, we had nine. Oh, my goodness. But both of our golden retrievers uh, passed away in the last six months. Oh, I'm sorry. So we've got a what's called a teddy bear dog. Oh, those are so a cute. little white thing that yips at everybody. <laughs> yep. And then we have Edna, who's a uh, Newfoundland. We're getting a new golden retriever in July. And in the meantime, we have five cats, including Evan Rood, who's about 18 years old and uh, has been very close to uh, meeting his maker in the last couple of months. But by the end of these very bad days, he seems to recover and he seems to be doing all very well. So... 18 years is a yeah, long time. He's, 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 he's making it. Good. That's good. Uh, do you have any pet peeves? Pet peeves. Um, 
Well, in politics, it's when people make pronouncements without either full disclosure of their interests or without knowing or without sharing all of the facts. So, for example, somebody may make a judgment about some city service like Madison Metro or Monona Terrace. And in both instances, they'll look at how much money comes in and how much money goes out. And that is the sole basis for their making a decision. Well, if Madison Metro disappeared and the subsidies disappeared, you can't imagine how congested our roads would be. The cost of maintaining our roads, the additional salt, which would eventually run into the lakes, would be a consequence. So you really have to understand the externalities. When you look at Monona Terrace, you don't just look at the rental income and the cost of operating the facility, but you have to look at the room tax that's generated by all these hotels, the volume of business for the restaurants, for the shops. You got to look at a larger universe than just the ledger sheet. And that, that kind of really irritates me when people don't understand, or even worse yet, they do understand, but they, they don't do a proper analysis when they should know better. You know, most people just say they don't like it when people crack their knuckles. Uh, I'm <laughs> so sorry. That's very specific. No, it's, <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a very specific pet peeve. Okay, this is, this is one of my favorite ones. Wisconsin bucket list. So is there something sort of stereotypically Wisconsin that you've never done that you might like to try? Well, I've done it, but it's been a number of years. Okay, that's that'll work. Summerfest. Oh, yeah. I just have not gotten to Summerfest in recent years. So that's that's one thing I'd really like to do. And then, and this is coincidental with the campaign, there are some supper clubs up north I'd like to get to, which mm-hmm. I have yeah. not. For example, I just drove back uh, from Port Wing, which is actually along Lake Superior and a little bit further north than Superior, Wisconsin. Oh, wow. So I drove back from there on Saturday, and it was almost a 12-hour drive because I went up there at 6.30 in the morning. I headed out and did two stops along the way and came back. But there were a whole lot of places where I just really wanted to just drop in yeah. for supper. Yeah. And, you know, I just knew that if I was going to get home at a reasonable time and not get too tired, yeah, I had to keep going. Okay, this is the last one. Favorite Wisconsin cheese. Oh, geez. Oh, come on. (laughs) Mm. Well, I'm a big fan of Swiss cheese on a ham sandwich. Okay. But then again, um, there's certain cheeses at... Novanto, this little pizza restaurant on Old Sock Road that they put on their pizzas mm. that I really like. So it's kind of a split decision, but I guess I'll stick with the Swiss. Okay, that's fair. That's, you know, the beauty of Wisconsin is you, you never have to choose. Certainly not with cheeses. You exactly. A million, <laughs> a million choices. You can, you can never go through them all. Well, thank you for coming in. Are there, do you have any parting words you want to leave listeners with? Anything else you want to add? Well... We, one thing we didn't talk about was food. That's true. And um, I just really encourage people to find great local sources for fresh food. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many of our Wisconsin restaurants make it a point since you raised the question of the cheese. Yeah, definitely. And the beer. Yes. And there's just so much more that goes with it. That's true. Uh, whether it's berries or beef or greens. So that's that's my parting my parting thought. That's a good parting thought. Eat well. Thanks for listening to Wedge Issues. Our theme music is Oh Wisconsin by Loxley. We'll be back each week with new episodes, so be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever else you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, you can give us a rating or a review and tell your friends about it. If you have any feedback or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse Opie, J-E-S-S-I-E-O-P-I-E, or you can email me at J-O-P-O-I-E-N at Madison.com. You can also check out other Cap Times podcasts like The Corner Table or Mad Splainers. Join us next week for an interview with gubernatorial candidate Dana Walks. We'll see you then. Yeah.